So why do you then have to figure out that it has to be a very important subject? The subject is unimportant. I like telling the story about the lady I met in British Columbia, in Vancouver Island. I was sitting beside her at the banquet, and I said to her, how long have you been a Toastmaster? She said, uh, three years. Oh, I said, you're a distinguished Toastmaster, so. Oh, no, 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 she says, no, 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 I've only done three speeches. Three speeches? What's keeping you? She says, I can't find anything important to write a speech about. <laughs> oh, I said, that's what's keeping you. Okay. And when you find this important subject, and when you find the time to write the speech, and when you come to the club to deliver it, will the local television station arrive and fill it? Oh, no, she says, why would they do that? And when you finish your speech, I said, will it be taken to the local library for future generations to read it? She says, no, she says, why would they do that? I said, well, then why does it have to be about something important? I say that again. Why does it have to be about something important when you're learning how to write a speech? That comes later if you wish, but not at the start. If you're playing golf, you pick up a job and you try to swing it, you get lessons, and you practice, and you practice, and you practice, and you might get to be a reasonably good golfer. But nobody at anything they pick up is an expert on day one, or day 21, or day 100 or more. It doesn't happen like that. See, you're thinking, but that is the case. And that is the most common mistake people in Toastmasters make. I can't find anything to write about. You can find something to write about anywhere. Anything, no matter how small it is. Because it's how to put the speech together is what you're learning, as we show. Now, I'm looking at you, looking at me, and you seem to be taken aback at that. Because everyone may want to win the World Championship for public speaking. I'm exaggerating, but you might like to win your club contest. But you won't win your club contest until you learn how to write a speech properly. Correct? So the emphasis has to be on learning the basics of writing a speech. So I said just there. That's what I told you the story about. So this is an old adage, best is the enemy of good. Have you heard that adage? That expression? We have the 80 20 rule. 80% what you get is 20% of your effort. Trying to be the best is a good, is a good motto in life. But waiting to be the best will be waiting a long time unless you put some effort in at the start to get you towards being the best. Confidence to deliver. Well, we know that trust has to be to provide a safe environment. Is Douglas here? Douglas, are you here? If you read it, you read it in the in the book and but the program you had about know, Douglas's career in Toastmasters where he joined the club and he had to give his confidence communicator speeches nineteen times, it says, before he was he was told he was okay to be a confident communicator. In the old days, where there was a past fail. If you were failed, if certain people didn't think you were good enough, so we've come a long way from that. Toastmasters now is very supportive. They, they say, This is what you did well, this is how you can do better. We think you're pretty okay. Isn't that how it's done? Well, that's the way it should be done, anyway. Okay, evaluations are helpful and positive. Do you have evaluation slips here, pieces of paper that you fill out with the audience? Yes. You read them all, you read them, everybody says, well done, I like the speech, etc., etc. So your confidence builds, which is very important. Is this confidence built on quicksand? That could be you. There's a big 
Here's a big question. Are you speaking and communicating? Or are you just speaking? Okay, so what do I mean by that? I heard hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of speeches all over the world. And many, many is the time I sit listen to a speech and I say, what's that about? So I go to it. Then I decide it's about something here. And then after another while, I think it's about this. And then after another while, I think it's about this. And I finish up, I don't know what it's about. And I'm going to, uh, I've been a member of Rotary International for the last 25 years. And every Monday we have a uh, an invited speaker at our lunch. And these come from the professional classes of Dublin, professional people, heads this, senior civil servants, people who are at the top of the profession. Nine out of ten failed to communicate with us. Well, they talk. No problem with the talking, but they don't tell us anything because they try to tell us too much. And they haven't it in any shape or form that we can follow it. So as soon as they stand up and finish, we've forgotten what they were telling us. Now be honest, have you heard a speech in your club that does that? There's only one honest person, a lady from Los Angeles. Have you not heard speeches that you have no idea what it was about when it was finished? No? Yes. Let you try to put your hand up at the back, please. Try to put his hand up. See, he's an honest descendant of an Irish person. Mm. I seem to have a difficulty convincing that this is true. And unless you're all marked speakers over here, you're an exception to the rule. Talking or speaking is not in itself communicating. Right. Well, it's not what I say. It's what my audience hears, feels, understands, remembers, and acts upon. And that at the end of your speech, of my speech, you can't have any of that and not have failed. Or if you're making a speech and your audience doesn't feel it, understand it, remember it, and act upon it, then you will get to it. So the end result, the end and objective of any speech is to pass some message from the speaker to the audience. That has to be clear, concise, and understood. If you're not doing that, then you're just speaking. You're not communicating. All right, so how do we speak, or how do we communicate? We do it through conversation, through the written word, and through the speech. But the difference is crucial. Can anybody tell me what the difference, why the difference is crucial between those three? But you see, if I have a conversation with this man here, in English, <laughs> he cannot keep asking me questions until he fully understands what I'm telling Or likewise, I can ask him questions and I understand what he means. If he writes me a report, I can read it and read it and read it and read it until I fully understand it. If I don't understand it, I can look up the dictionary, but I can understand it. But in a speech, how many chances does your audience get understand it. How many chances? One. One and one only. One and one only. If you talk for seven minutes and the audience doesn't understand you, they have no chance of finding out what you meant because it's not. And that's why the difference is so crucial. Totally crucial. I want that to sink in. Because if you, if you get that bit, the 
there is an enormous difference between those three things. And the difference is that you have the chance in the first two to, 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 to elaborate or to delve into the speech. But you have no chance in number three. You have no chance. Unless you get it, first time, gone. So the three critical questions before you write any speech. Who is your audience? Well, what is your subject matter, your message, your theme, idea? And why are you saying it? Your purpose or message. Now, if you start writing this speech and you don't answer those three questions, then you're going to be speaking, but not communicating. Go to Dutch. Now, the good thing is that in Toastmasters, we can decide whatever audience we like. We can say it's a but I can decide if you want to specialize speech, but normally a Toastmaster is a pretty common audience in the you want to know your audience. And if you're speaking outside Toastmasters, that's the very first thing you must ask you. Who am I speaking to? So if you want to speak about, uh, about uh, whatever, in, a, in an old person's home. Let's say you talk about uh, about uh, Ronnie Marathon and you go to a, an elderly person's home. Would that be a suitable audience for that? No. And you go to so many people, a group of people who are 20 years old and you start talking to them about pension plans when you're 70, is that a suitable topic? No. So you must you must know your audience. Why are you saying it? Why are you giving the speech? Why? Is it to inform? Is it to persuade or motivate? Is it to inspire? Is it to entertain? <laughs> but it has to be one of those. Do you find those, uh, those purposes in Toastmasters manuals? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you find inspire as number 10? Persuade is number nine, and to inform can be anyone, and to entertain is the advanced manual somewhere, isn't it? If your speech hasn't a clear purpose, there's no point in speaking. If your speech hasn't a clear purpose, there's no point in speaking. How can you write a speech if you don't know what the end result is going to be? I, I liken it to a journey in a car. If you leave Kashyung today with no destination in mind, you could finish up anywhere, couldn't you? Your audience won't get your message. Think of it as if you're driving somewhere. You need to know where you want to end up. Therefore, it makes sense that when we're writing a speech, we have to decide that first. And the minute you decide where you want to end up, the whole thing becomes very easy. The specific purpose is a one-sentence statement about what you hope to accomplish in your speech. And this falls into three sections. Criteria. It's worded from the audience's viewpoint. What do you want the audience to do after your speech? Is the wording precise? Is it? Should it be realistic and possible to achieve? Do you want time to write those things down? Never seen it before? 
to you are the very same audience as every other audience I've given this presentation to. You're all the same. I'll tell you why you're all the same. Want me to tell you? Because nobody, when I ask that question, has ever answered, oh yes, I've seen that before. It's in page three, it's in page 18 in project three in your competent communicator manual. That's where it is, written down word for word, comma for comma, full stop with full stop, exactly like that. And none of you have seen it. Isn't that amazing? All over Ireland I've done that. All over Ireland I've done that. Nobody ever seen it. And there it is. Page 18 and 19. 19 in the older version, 18 in the newer version, or vice versa. You see, this is the most important bit of the whole thing. This is the most important bit. If you have no purpose, then you're... How can you write a speech and have no end in mind? If you, if you read Stephen Covey's great book about seven habits of highly successful people, number one is begin with the end in mind. Begin with the end in mind. So there's a hundred people or so in this room. You're all Toastmasters. Yeah. And it, nobody confesses to having seen that before. I, I, I think I leave now, I, honestly. I think I'm wasting my time here. Okay. Lester is, pho is, is photographing me. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to let Lester photograph me. I had you won a big competition yesterday. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry for embarrassing you, but I'm, I'm really not sorry. I really haven't, no, because I really am I'm not sorry. Because I want you to know that that's written down right there on that page, and you've all passed it by, and you haven't noticed it. So will you go back and read it again? That is an essential piece of information, that bit. Absolutely essential. Okay, I don't have to tell you that these three bunches of flowers, and I'm using those because if I got three bunches of flowers from the shop and they were exactly the same, let's say I got 50 flowers, 10 of this and 10 of that and 10, whatever, and I got exactly the same three bunches of flowers, and I gave one to a seven-year-old child, and I gave one to that young man there who's never arranged a flower in his life, I'd say. Don't tell me you're a florist, you know? You're not. And I gave it to this lady over here who's a professional florist, a lady who arranges flowers. And I give them an hour, and I say, come back and show me what you've done. Which set of flowers would look the best? The flowers. Well, why is that? They're the same flowers. The way they're arranged. The way they're arranged. Now, if you can think instead of flowers, think of your ideas. It's how they're arranged makes the difference. That is, that is so important. It's the arrangement of your ideas that enables the, in this case, the person who hears you, understands and follows your, your speech. Okay, here's a whole lot of ideas in your head when you come in your writing speech. These are a whole lot of ideas. And they're all over the place. There's thousands of them. And that's one of the reasons people can't actually start writing a speech. There are too many ideas. Too many. Too many flowers. So, what do we do? How can they be turned into a speech that your audience can hear, feel, understand? remember and act upon. So, <clears throat> with your audience with complex ideas, do they get it? No. You can shout out, no, I don't mind. If your audience is faced with random ideas, do they get it? No. If your audience is confronted with a simple speech with a clear purpose, do they get it? Yes. And you've all heard those speeches where you say, that was very simple. But simple is 
the criterion that works. If it's simple, it means you understood it. If it's not simple, it means you didn't understand it. The, uh, the speaker's job is to make it simple. The simpler, the better. I talked about Jock Elliott yesterday in my, in my keynote. How was it that from 1993 to 2008, I could remember the central part, part of his speech? Because it was very simple. Friends of my blood, friends of my life, friends of my heart. We talked about the three of them. We had an opening in conclusion. Bingo, he's the world champion. Complex, not in the slightest. Not in the slightest. Random ideas, not in the slightest. Just three simple ideas. And in fact, if you were listening carefully to me yesterday, I had three simple ideas, which was decide you're going to achieve your dream, decide you're willing to pay the price, pay the price. It works. It works everywhere. All right, Mr. Einstein. I like this quotation. He says, if you can't explain something simply, it means you don't fully understand it yourself. Isn't that true? Yes. 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 I might, you might be sitting there thinking that I'm not making a good job, but <laughs> I have to put up with that. If you can't explain something simply, it means you don't fully understand it yourself. Make it simple for your audience. Arrange the ideas for the ears of the audience. The flowers were for the eyes. The ideas are for the ears. These are signposts that are essential so your audience can follow your ideas and pieces of information. And every speech has transitions. And I call them signposts. So you're going on this journey with your audience. And there's a signpost every now and again saying, I know where I am with your speech. I am following your speech to the conclusion. I don't stop halfway and say, I don't know where we're going. Right. All right. Your, your audience follows effortlessly. Effortlessly. It flows. The audience follows your words and ideas to your desired conclusion. Your audience stays connected. All true. Stays connected. They follow your train of thought. If they don't follow your train of thought, you blast them. They get it. Now, uh, there are two big words there, cognitive gymnastics. But that's, uh, it's a long-winded way of saying they're confused. They're confused. You've sat in an audience and you're confused about what the speaker is saying or what the speaker is trying to get across. The minute your audience is confused, you're in trouble. Okay, we get on to the real business now. How are we doing for time there, Madam Timer? Ten gone. Ten o'clock now. Okay. So we have a half an hour left. Okay. Now here are the six pillars of the competent communication manual. You'll say, well, there's 10 speeches of the competent communication manual. Why are we only six there? Anybody would like to volunteer a guess? Well, number one is just getting up and speaking about yourself for four to six minutes. Number seven is not there because it's research your speech, so you get it out of a paper or a book or a magazine, you research it. <coughs> number oh, number eight, number nine and ten is not there. Why, why, why isn't number nine and ten there? Because it's over here. That, that number three speech has to have a clear purpose, but it can be informed, entertained, persuade, or inspire. But you'll be better off using an informed speech at the start because it's much easier. The ones over here are more difficult. That's why they're number nine and ten. Particularly number ten, which is inspiration. And the difference between nine and ten, and people confuse it all the time, 
is nine, is it appeals to your rational senses. Number ten appeals to your emotion, your heart. So you can make an inspirational speech by, by saying, I've been to wall last Saturday in my garden. You really can't. But you could persuade people to build a wall in their garden, couldn't you? So how many times do I hear a stage 10, a project 10, with a subject that is not in any way emotional? More often than I want, I can tell you. So persuade, head, inspire, heart. So if I wrote a speech for number two, it's very important to understand that that speech could be that, or that, or that, or that, or that. So every speech has organization, every speech has a purpose, every speech has words, every speech has some body language, every speech has some vocal variety, and some speeches can have a visual aid. I find, more often than I ought to find, that as soon as beginners get past those two and get over here, they forget completely about those two. They're now into vocal variety and, and, and gestures and they're jumping around the place and they're falling down and they're... <laughs> and they do that in the world of finance too, I can tell you. But that's not the way... That's not the way people speak in public outside Toastmasters. I mean, the three people I showed you at the start, Martin Luther King, he raised his hand for about five seconds in that whole episode. Mr. Obama never moves a hand at all. John F. Kennedy never, never moved a hand at all. Just spoke with the power of his words. But I see people all the time, and they get as far as here, they've completely forgotten about that. And I think you approved it because you didn't recognize that piece I gave you from, from Project 3. You know, I'll be in clear purpose. No, you recognize it. All right. All right. What more can I say about that? I can say that if you write a speech, it could be any of those be any of those, but it has to have each of those in every speech. Every speech has to be organized, every speech has to have a purpose. Obviously every speech has words. The nicer the words, the better the speech, but most of us can speak pretty okay in, 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 for words. We have to have some body language so we're not just stuck to the ground, and we have to have some vocal variety. So, but not shouting and roaring and screaming and doing all the things that people do. All right, okay, this is it, the nine parts of every speech. This is the way you would deliver it. You would get attention, you decide the what, you tell them what you're going to tell them, you have three main points, you tell them what you've told them, you have a message that reflects your purpose, the why, and number nine refers back to number one. That's the way you deliver the speech, but that's not the way you write it. We're back to the plan. This is the plan. That is the order in which you write the speech. This is the order in which you should write every speech. And the strange thing is, you don't write it by the opening line. You decide what it is you want to write about, the what. And we do that now with minutes on the board. Then you decide why. What's my purpose? The minute you decide the why, the purpose, these three things jump out. And number three is you give them an idea of what's coming. You give them a you give them a, a heads up about what's coming. Then you summarize so that they will remember it even more. And then you're left with getting an opening and an ending. And you're looking there now, you say, that, that's too simple. That couldn't possibly work. How have I spent years in Toastmasters and I haven't figured that out? 
The answer is, it does work. It works extremely well, and very simply. You might say, how, how can you wait till the very end? You see, if you know what's coming here, it's very easy to get uh, a question or a story or a statistic there. And then number nine, in some way goes back to this. It's called a, a, a callback. If you read journals, they will, in the paper, they will, they will set a question maybe there at the start and it says, um, Lester was a very happy man in Kaohsiung last weekend. That's you, Lester, okay? And then it goes on to say how Lester entered the competition and Lester did this and Lester finished up. And the very last bit would be Lester went home happy after his weekend in Kasha. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Drinks in the house for everybody. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right, okay. So, sequence of writing speech, number two. We have to decide the past. So, we're going to do that now with your help. I apologize to the people at the back if you can see the what's on the on this board here, but I do my best. <coughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to uh, we're going to we're going to choose. Oh, what happened? We're going to decide what is it we're going to talk about. What, what is the subject matter? So you choose. Something that we all know something about. That I know something about because I have to do this speech. So something that everybody knows about. Let's, uh, let's, uh, let's pick a simple one. Let's say it's called Kaushal. Is that OK? All right, Kaushan. So we're going to talk about Kaushan. I just put a big K there, right? Now we know that we're going to talk about. I have to break it. I have to break it. The whole place. So we decided the what. We've started at number two. Okay, so far. Now we decide the why. Why are we? What are we going to do? Are we going to inform people about Kaushan? Are we going to persuade people, maybe, to come and visit? I mean, I got a gift from the mayor yesterday with a big, big tourist guy. He's trying to persuade me to go back and spend money. <laughs> As he should. Is it to inspire or is it to entertain? What do you want the audience to hear, understand, remember, feel, and act upon? Well, let's, let's take to persuade because it's pretty simple. Will we take persuade? Are you all agreed? All right, so we're going, to, we're going to make, this is going to be persuade. Persuade, all right? Yes. All right, now, now let's leave that there a second. We've done two and eight. The next one now is the body of the speech, four, five, and six. So we're, are we going to use three facts, facts, F-A-C-T-S, about Kaisho? Are we going to uh, use what, where, and when? It might be historic. What happened, where it happened, when it happened. We might use past, present, and future, which is where it was Kaishong 200 years ago. Where is it today? Where, what's the vision for Kaishong in the future? Or it could be a problem, a cause, and a solution. Well, that's not going to work for Kaishong. So let's take, uh, oops. Let's take three facts. So what are the three things you would tell your audience if you were speaking back in Ireland why they should visit Kaushal? What are the three things about Kaushal that you would talk about? Be any three things. There's a man putting his hand up to the back. Yes, sir? The nine markets are very good. <laughs> nine markets. Is that a nightclub, is it? <laughs> the nine markets, is it? Alright, so okay, so let's 
Let's put on the markets. All right, markets. And what's, what's so good about the markets that you would eat? You would eat. All right. Uh, Western food, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what you do at the markets. Pray. 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 Oh, play. I thought you said pray. <laughs> I was shocked, I was shocked. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I can give me a 13 and we could do the markets. Shop. Shop, okay, we put in shop here, okay? All right, now, that's the markets. What's, what's, what's another thing you would tell the people in Ireland to come to Kaishan, Kaishan to see? Hold on. The wonderful people. When, when are you planning to import them? <laughs> All right. Well, we we keep people for the next one, and I tell you why when we come to it. So, what else? What else? Have you got? Love River. That goes with the play, does it? Love River. Food. Yeah. Oh, right. River, right? River. Anything else? Harbor. You got a museum? Yeah. I mean, this doesn't have to be the truth, okay? <laughs> museum. Museum. <laughs> All right. Uh, what else? Is there, is, is there anything else to be seen in culture? Harbour. Yeah, Harbour. Okay. Harbour. 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 Okay. Uh, Mountain. Mountain. <laughs> I can't believe you. You're the prayer guy. Okay. <laughs> This is the prayer guy, right? <laughs> he goes out for a night out and he's praying. He's praying. He gets down on his knees. Okay. Now we have enough in three, I think. Now, now we come to the people. And uh, you see, P O P L E. You see, if you start off with the non-human bit, as we have, and you you finish with the people, which is the personal bit, it makes more sense than having it the other way around. If I put people at number four, it wouldn't be as good a speech as having it at number six. Because it's a connection. It's a connection. All right, now, three is tell them. Well, I should be moving this on, shouldn't I? Hold on, say. Okay, let's move on. Tell them what you want to tell them so that they can follow your ideas. These are signposts for their ears. Remember we talked about the analogy of travel. Uh, tell them what you've told them, number seven, so that they remember the points that you made. Get their attention with a question, a relevant quote, a story, or use a statistic. So we need to do that now. So how are we going to get how are you going to get these people back in Ireland's attention? Is it a question? It says, We could make it. We could make it up. Do, do you know that over five million people visit Kaohsiung every every year and turn back from the railway station? That's a joke. I'm oh, sorry. It's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> we we could say that, couldn't we? Yeah. yeah. Good. That that gets uh, five million. Right. And then we come over here. We we told them now. Told. Them. And now we have uh, we refer back. Right. Refer back. Okay. This isn't taking too long, is it? That took about three minutes. 
I'm sorry about the people in the back, you probably can't read it, but if we go forward here, refer back to the opening, and it gives a sense of completion. All right, here we go. All right, now I'm going to give this speech. Emma, you're going to introduce me. But uh, it's a stage, uh, stage project three, and the title is Why Visit Kaohsiung? Why visit Kaohsiung is the title. So I'll have to do a stand up and say, with a speech entitled Why Visit Kaohsiung, please welcome Ted Carr. All right, will you do that? Okay. Are you timing me for how long it's going to take for this actual speech? Today, we are very honored to invite our speaker, Ted Copper, to give our speech about why visit Kaohsiung. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. <laughs> Madam Toastmasters, ladies and gentlemen, did you know that last year over 5 million people from all around the world visited Kaohsiung? It's an amazing figure and they all went home extremely satisfied and happy. Today I'm going to tell you about Kaohsiung and what you will see and enjoy if you visit there. It's a wonderful city. I'm going to tell you about, about the markets where you can eat, shop and play. And if you eat, shop and play too much, you can then go and pray for forgiveness. <laughs> There are so many restaurants with, with, with food of Chinese origin, Japanese origin, Taiwanese origin, all different nations' food. Food everywhere. Taiwan is noted for its food, and Kaishang is particularly noted for its food. You can, you can shop all modern shops, all the world famous brands, Ralph Lauren. Uh, oh, I can't think of any others. Uh, all the leading brands are here. You find them in New York, you find them in London, you find them in Kuala Lumpur, you find them in Shanghai, you find them in Kaohsiung. You will not be short of stuff to buy when you visit Kaohsiung. And of course, if you're young, you can play. There's a lot of nightlife, music, dancing, film, arts, Drinking, all that you would possibly need if you're under 25. <laughs> if you're my age, well, there's more sedate pleasures, such as cinema, theater, libraries, <coughs> comfortable beds for sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> then, as you can see, beautiful river here called the Love River. It's a beautiful river. It's known far and wide throughout Kaohsiung. Maybe not that much far and wide, but it's known in Kaohsiung as a famous river, is it not? Yes, yes it is. Uh, the museum, the Museum of Modern Art, then you have the Museum of Ancient Antiquities, modeled on the museum in Taipei, which is also worth to visit if you have time to go up there and visit that and then see the Chinese uh, relics that go back six or eight thousand years. And then the harbor. It's a beautiful harbor here because, of course, Kaishan is a port. It's the major industrial town and it's a beautiful harbor. The climate is just so wonderful all year round. In November, the end of November, you can get a day of 20 degrees with the sunshine. And you Irish people, you, uh, will, you will never have trees in Taiwan or Kaohsiung without leaves. There are leaves on the trees all the year round. So that's, that's great to see leaves in the middle of winter. And then the people. Well, the people are so friendly. They're always smiling. They say, Ni hao na. <laughs> <laughs> they say, Why I mean. <laughs> uh, they're so gentle. So beautiful people, so helpful, such fun to be with. 
there's a whole lot of Toastmasters clubs in, in Kaushan. And they hold conferences. And the conferences are great fun. There's dancing, and there's singing, and there's eating. And if you're a Toastmaster, that is absolutely the place to come to that particular weekend when there's a conference in Kaushan. So I told you, I told you about the river. I told you something about the markets. I told you about the river, how beautiful it is, and about the people who are even more beautiful. So, we know that five million people visited last year. Will you come make it and make it 500 million plus? You won't regret it. It's a lovely place. Come visit Kaushya.
And what I can't imagine life without is my mobile phone. Yeah. How many of you love your mobile phone as much as I do? <laughs> well, what I'm going to talk to you about is why I can't live without it. Why I love it so much. And why you should buy the newest Samson Galaxy Note. <laughs> Point one. Why can't I live without it? I wake up in the morning, it wakes me up. I look at it and it tells me the time, shows me the weather for the day, what my friends are doing on Facebook, what people that aren't my friends are doing on Facebook, <laughs> and pictures of people on Facebook. And then it's got my appointments for the day, things I've got to do. It's my communication to look at my email. It's my mode of communication. It's got Line, it's got Facebook, it's got WhatsApp, it's got my email. That is some of the reason why I am so in love with it. I can't live without it. <laughs> so, I'm also going to tell you the disadvantages. It's like heroin. <laughs> because once it gets in your bloodstream, it's addictive. How many of you have ever left your house, you're five minutes away, oh my gosh, I forgot my mobile phone. <laughs> and you go all the way back home and you go get it, even though you're going to be late for what you're supposed to be there for. Because you love it so much, you can't live without it. It's almost like your clothes. You feel naked without it. <laughs> and finally, I'm going to tell you about the Galaxy Note 5. Man, this is just, I just got this. It's such an amazing phone. I've had the Galaxy Note 1, the Galaxy Note 2, the Galaxy Note 3, my wife has a Galaxy Note 4, and now I got the Galaxy Note 5. It is amazing. One of the best features I like. How many of you see something great? Oh, I need to take a picture, and you've got to open the phone app, and by the time it loads, the picture's gone. <laughs> you know what? This. You tap, tap the button twice, boom, boom. The camera's up there and you're ready to shoot. Bam! I'm gonna shoot you right now at this audience. There you go. I've got a wonderful memory of this event because it's so fast. So, what I've told you is I'm a man in love. I've told you why I love it. It's such an integral part of my life. But be careful because it is addicting and it's hard to live without and therefore ladies and gentlemen i urge you to go out and buy a new <laughs> samsung galaxy note 5.
together, together. Together, together. down here to take the photograph, not to, st not to stand in it. <laughs> well, now that you're here, you're very welcome, okay? <laughs> Smile and it's a picture. <laughs> 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 